Hey, you guys, welcome to the RPA and writing an offer with myself. My name is Hallie Wright, and I'm the team leader out of Long Beach. And also with me is my partner in crime, Stephanie Alatori, who is out of the Calabasas office. Yay. And look at all those wonderful red day things that you guys did and got together. Mm -hmm. How fun. That looks awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Stephanie, do you have any comments before we get started? No. No. no? <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, well, if you can chat for just a minute while I pull. So I pull some stuff up if you can chat for just a second. Okay, so since Stephanie's not talking, just give me one second. <laughs> okay, so let me, I'm going to mute. Okay. There, does that seem okay? Uh, it's a little echoey. <clears throat> better? No, better? Uh, better for right now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So I have the things brought up now. So writing an RPA, the residential purchase agreement, that's what the RPA stands for, right? So before we even write an RPA, <clears throat> what is the process, Stephanie, that kind of gets us to where we're ready to put pen to paper? Oh, can you enable, Stephanie, can you enable screen sharing? There you go. Perfect, thanks. <clears throat> so what's the process that we kind of go through before we even write an offer? So as Hallie has written up here, I know I'm looking over here at the cameras over here, so it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so you did your search, right? Well. All right, so there's all different kind of things, you know, obviously we want to have our, we've already had, we're doing RPA training, so we want to make sure you've already had the conversation regarding the lender and all that kind of stuff, making sure that they're approved, so on and so forth. So before you write, you want to make sure that you review the MLS listing, right? And then you do this before you even show the house, mm -hmm. right? You want to make sure that you're looking at the private remarks um and just have a conversation with a listing agent to find out what it's going to take right to get your offer accepted over anyone else's what's the seller's motivation why are they selling remember it's all about asking those questions but sometimes you get some, some of the details in the private remarks right mm -hmm. yeah and you you want to confirm all that you know how many times i've seen people that, you know, especially large listing agents that will say, you know, send offers to such and such email. And when you call them to confirm that they say, oh, actually send it to me directly. I list in my assistant's email or send it to my assistant, vice versa. Or, you know, again, just confirm what those submission details are because, you know, until they actually see it, it's not actually submitted. So you want to make sure that you're all on the same page with that. Yep, absolutely. And then also that you want to, you know, have a, um, like she says here on her next one, call listing agent, ask the questions, right? It's all about building that rapport. They will know based on their conversations with you and how you act with them, what the transaction will be like. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like one of our agents just left, uh, she was in a multiple, she's in a multiple offer situation, et cetera. And they waited a week, right? It was it coming soon Then it became active. Other people came in. So now there's eight offers, eight to nine offers on this property, right? But she's been in contact with him nonstop, right? But in a good way, but nonstop over the last week and a half. So therefore, because of her persistence and the eagerness on behalf of her clients, that he made sure she was countered. 
okay? So he included her as one of the three that got countered back and being in that sold seller um, multiple counter offer. And that was because she built the rapport, right? Mm -hmm. Asked what the clients were in need of because they wanted to make sure that they could run it back, you know, for free, basically for another month. So just finding out the details and what is important to the seller, right? So it's really, it's really in your best interest to be not emotionally attached. Okay. I know the emotions are, are uh, high for a lot of buyers and sellers and the agents, but remember you are there. This is business for you. Okay. So we want to make sure that we try to keep our emotions out of it when we're, especially when we're just trying to get our offer submitted, <laughs> yeah. right. And, and et cetera. So we just want to be as professional as we can. So the listing agent will be like, man, I want to do business with you. Make mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, absolutely. Those are all really good points. Um, and then next thing you do is call the lender. This is a really important step before you actually write the RPA. And it's why we kind of go over this before we go through that. And that's to confirm some of the information that you're going to be actually filling out in the RPA itself. Most people don't think about to call their lender before they actually set the escrow length, right? So they built rapport with the listing agent and the listing agent, <clears throat> one of the questions we ask, you know, does your client, do you have any preferences to escrow length? Do they want a short escrow? Do they want a long escrow? Some clients might need a long escrow because they're finding a replacement property versus some might need a short one because they want to get it done and move on. So also call your lender about the escrow length. When the listing agent says we want a short escrow, the worst thing you can do to tank your deal is write a number in there without checking with the lender. Now we have some lenders here in our area that are getting tr deals closed, conventional deals closed in like 17 to 21 days, which is insane, but it's happening, right? So you may even be able to do shorter than 30, but the whole point is, is you don't wanna put yourself in a box. If the lender doesn't have all those things set out into place and ready to go, you're going to tank your deal because it's gonna end up taking longer than the time that your client's agreeing upon via contract, okay? So ask them that. Also contingency length. Do not waive any contingencies, particularly the appraisal contingency without speaking to the lender and setting the client's expectations. Why is that? When we shorten our contingencies, which are our safety nets in the contract for your clients to get their EMD or their earnest money deposit back, when we waive those, it actually affects their ability to be able to purchase the property right? So we don't want to waive an appraisal contingency if the client doesn't have extra money to come up with down to, in order to make up the difference if the appraisal comes in low, right? Your lender is going to be able to offer you some of that insight because they looked at their proof of funds. They hopefully, if they're a good lender, they went through all of that information, right? So they could probably tell you, yeah, it's not really going to affect it much or, ooh, it's going to be really hard for them to come up with a cash difference, right? Ask for a pre-qualification letter or DU approval as well as proof of funds. Don't ask your client for this. Go directly to the lender. Again, this is another good way for you to build rapport with the lender to be able to have that information sent directly to him. As Stephanie stated earlier, we want to make this process as easy and as calming as possible for these clients, right? Now, when you start bugging them and you're asking them, hey, send this, do this, do you have this? It's going to put extra stress on them before you even open escrow. So remember, we're the peacekeepers here. We're the ones that want to smooth everything over. So just ask the lender for that. What loan type and how much down? If it doesn't state that on the pre-approval letter, you need to clarify that, right? Just because someone says conventional doesn't necessarily mean that they're putting 20% down, right? It could be 15, it could be 10, it could be 5%. Okay. So just make sure you clarify that interest rate. I do like putting the interest rate into the contract. So I do like asking that we're going to show you where to put it in to be able to help protect your buyers, just in case the interest rate all of a sudden takes a dive and goes up into the fours and fives. Okay. Confirm liquidity for EMD. <clears throat> As we talked about before the earnest money deposit, um, some people call it the good faith deposit, is going to have to be transferred into the escrow account within three business days of opening escrow, okay? So this is one of the questions that I like to ask the lender because I like to find out how liquid they are with that money, 
remember the earnest money deposit comes from a portion of their down payment. So the lender is going to, oh, I'm sorry. Does someone have a question? Yes, I had a question. <laughs> um, my first question is, let's say you have a client that is doing a VA loan. Do you confirm with the lender whether they can do a VA loan on that property or the HOA? So it depends on what type of property. So a VA loan on a single family home doesn't have an HOA. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see. But you know how sometimes with like FHA or VA loans, it's you're not hundred percent sure if it if it qualifies, right? So that's only in the instance that it's a condo that there is an HOA. It could be a single family home with an HOA, but if an HOA exists, it does have to be VA or FHA certified. That is correct. So single family homes are always VHA and FHA certified. No, there's, they don't need a certification. Does that make sense? So Mona, you only need a certification if there's an HOA. Uh, my question is, are people with VA loans and FHA loans allowed to purchase single family homes like, to qualify? Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Family, for sure. Yeah. The condos where you need to check with the HOA, if they have an HOA. Yeah. So yeah. You, on a condo, you need to check and make sure that it's FHA. Like condo apartment. Technically, oh. any, any property that has an HOA has to have a certification, right? But who do you check with? You check with the lender. The lender can look that up. Okay. If the lender looks it up and they say, no, it doesn't have a certification. It's never been certified or anything like that before. That's when you can check with the HOA. <clears throat> Excuse me. If they want to submit an offer like that. Again, Mona, this is only with an HOA. If you're writing an offer for an FHA or a VA that does not have an HOA, you guys will see that FHA VA addendum on the end of the RPA which automatically gets added the moment you check those boxes that says that they have to comply with the minimum property standards of both of those government backed loans, right? So no certification is needed because they're agreeing that it's going to be up to a certain standard. I see. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for elaborating. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So yeah, that's the next one. Uh, if writing a, for a condo, or anything with an HOA, FHA, VA, confirm eligibility of the property. Again, your lender can figure out that information for you. Don't go tracking the HOA down because in most instances, they're actually not allowed to talk to the buyer's representative unless you're in escrow, okay? Cool. Any other comments and things that we do before we actually write an offer? Question? <laughs> One more if I may ask. Um, yeah. So you know how you say you want to always check with the lender of their proof of funds and proof of something else pre-approval, right? Yeah. Uh, wouldn't you require this information before they even start their house search with you? So you make sure that they're compliant? Yeah. So that's a really good question, Mona. So as far as the proof of funds, normally we don't see that before we go search through, right? But we coach you guys to say, get a pre-approval before you go looking for houses. Okay. Now you need an updated pre-approval in most instances before you submit an offer. Now, why is that? Okay. So Mona, tell me this, <clears throat> Mona, I'm a lender and I pre-approve you for $1 million. Okay. And you're my, or I'm the agent and you say, great, Hallie, I'm pre-approved for a million dollars. Here's my pre-approval from such and such lender. It says, Mona, a million dollars, FICO scores, whatever, right? So Mona, we're writing an offer on a property that says that the property is actually worth, we're going to write an offer for 900,000. So you want to get that pre-approval for 900,000? A hundred. Why do you think that is? Because maybe they can reject your offer and they'll be like, no, you can afford more. I'm just saying, right? They know you can afford a million, so they might counter you back so it's and more say, of, say so something different. Yeah. It's more of the purpose of just being accurate with the pre approval. Exactly. Exactly. 
practice, do you ask the clients to show you their pre-approval or pre-qualification before showing homes to them? Because you don't want people wasting your time. I mean, that's, that's what I do. I mean, Stephanie, do you have any comments on that? I absolutely do. I absolutely, because you want to make sure that they have, that they have the funds. They have the funds. Yes. I know sometimes, you know, let's say if you get an off city lead or whatever, you want to be able to meet them in person. Or sometimes then you'll maybe have that one, maybe, take maybe one coffee. show and meet, you know, prior to, but it's just like, Hey, you know, if you're interested in this property and we're going to be writing an offer, please forward me your proof of funds and your pre-approval letter because we'll need to attach that to the offer that we're writing. Yeah. It's also, like I said before, it's also a really good opportunity for you to reach out to the lender and build that connection, particularly if it's somebody that you don't have that from, right? So Mona, you tell me, yeah, I've been pre-approved for 1 million. My next question is great. Can you please send me your lender's contact info so I can get all the necessary documents that I need in order to write an offer? The way you say it matters. You don't totally. Want to say, you know, yeah, like, totally. You're not pre approval and like, you're wasting my time because it's not a proper way to speak to people. Yeah, absolutely. How many more questions or comments? That was a good one, Mona. <laughs> She's good for now. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to write an offer in here. Uh, I'm just going to say one, two, three, main street. And we're going to say it's a residential and I'm not going to use my template. Oh, stop. All the little guys are, ah, no, sorry. The zoom guy is right in the way of this book window right here. Okay. Perfect. So now we're actually going to write the offer. So I am in my zip forms right now. If you guys don't have access to this, this is available to you via your local board association. So if you're a new agent and you're not a member of your board yet, you need to in order to get these documents. Don't get confused or overwhelmed, okay? So I've just created a new transaction for the sake of your organization. Keep everything in a transaction hub like you do here. It makes it a lot simpler, okay? I go over here and click this blue box and I'm gonna add forms. Here's the forms I want you guys to add. I want you to add a cover sheet, okay? I want you to add an RPA, okay? And I want you to add what's called the summary of offer. Don't accidentally click the RIPA. We're not RIPA, we're not Kelly RIPA. We want the RPA, okay? Right here. These are my three. Now you can, this isn't a zip forms class. You can have this done as an actual template where it's going to automatically add these in there when you go to do a contract. I didn't because I wanted to show you guys each one of the contracts that go into it. Okay. So let's pick, I just wrote an address in there. Um, you know what? Let me find, uh, <clears throat> Stephanie, do you have any comments right now? I forgot to get a listing ID number. Uh, do I have any comments? Um, no. Oh, but I do. I do want to ask a question because is is Philip still on the call? Yeah. Is he still there? Philip. He was piping earlier. I don't know if he's. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I was just going to ask him from you know from a listing. Uh, agent's perspective, right? What what he likes to uh, the conversations that he likes to have, right? With with potential uh, selling agents. Um, congratulations, Ray. What up? You close on it. <laughs> um, oh, go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys time savers because that's what I'm about when I'm writing the RPA. You should get it done so super fast if you do all these right uh, little tips and tricks. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to copy the listing ID number, okay? So I just went in here. We're going to write an offer for this one, actually. Um, it's a really nice property. Uh, it's one of the Shannon Jones properties. Um, it's just really gorgeous here. And it's in a really nice area of Park Estates of Long Beach. Okay, so I copy the listing ID number. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here and click this little button and I'm gonna click the MLS connect, okay? I have the residential listing type here. I'm gonna paste the listing ID. 
I want it to include the property photo and I'm going to find it. Okay. Now what this is going to do is this is going to connect all of the information on the MLS that you need in order to write an offer, including the listing agent, including um, the MLS number, all of that stuff. And it's going to import it, <coughs> excuse me, into your contracts. I want to replace the existing data. Great. So we've connected it on the MLS Connect. The next step, we're going to go in and we're going to go to the cover sheet. Okay. So Stephanie is buying this beautiful house. Did you know you were moving to Long Beach, Stephanie? I'm super excited. <laughs> She's super excited about it, right? <clears throat> Great. So I have Stephanie's information in here. Now, not everything in this cover sheet gets put on the RPA. So I'm only going to put in certain details that I know we're going to translate. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm putting Stephanie's name in here and I'm putting her email and I'm going to check the box so that her name appears as buyer one on all the contracts, right? She's buying it as a single woman, hashtag female power and <laughs> strength of a woman. Okay, great. So if you could see here, the MLS number's in there. The street address is in here. The zip code is in there. The parcel number's in here. <laughs> you guys don't just copy paste the stuff. It's so much easier to do everything like this, okay? So I'm gonna scroll down here and I'm gonna put in the purchase price. So Stephanie, you're gonna pay full price for this house, okay? Got it. So I have the purchase price in there, okay? I'm going to put in there the what else agreement date closing the offer escrow company we don't need that look at all this information down here here's my information um this is zero there we go this is zero two there we go great perfect it has all the listing agent the seller's broker's information in there easy Okay, so now that I filled this out, I'm going to hit save before I go back. Now, let's open up the RPA. Okay, this first page is the disclosure regarding agency relationship. So this is just laying out all the all the lines of, of really, you know, what you're doing as a representative to your clients, what they're doing in return, what we can and can't do, what the seller and buyer responsibilities are. And as you can see, because we put Stephanie's name in the buyer one, it's all right here. All that information is already done. So I'm going to go and I'm going to check the buyer box since so Stephanie's the buyer. Okay. And you can see my information's down here. Keller Williams Coastal Properties, my DRE license number. Okay. Scrolling through Fair Housing and Discriminatory Act. This is talking about fair housing. This is really important right now and is definitely a hot topic issue. So make sure you guys read through this and you can explain this to your clients. If you haven't done so already, you can always go on Forms Tutor right here at the top. And it's going to take you to that. Um, it's going to take you to the place where it's going to explain all of the portions of the RPA just like we've done before, line by line. You guys use this forms tutor, any form that you use, it's gonna explain everything. It makes it much simpler. Really easy, right? Great, let's go back to this. So we see Stephanie's name is on there for the buyer tenant. I just like to double check and scroll down. So you see, here's my brokerage firm. Here's the seller's brokerage firm. Uh, there's Stephanie's name, there's a license number, all of that's taken care of. Okay, so now we're to the meat and bones of the RPA, right, Steph? <clears throat> so this, I I, no, I said now we're to the meat and the bones of it. Let me shut my window. Um, now we're to the meat and the bones of what the actual RPA is. When we reference the RPA, yes, there's a bunch of different documents before and sometimes after if you're doing the FHA or VA or if you're doing some other advisory, but really this is what we're talking about when we talk about the RPA, right? So the date prepared up here, I like to always have the date prepared match the same date of signing, 
Now, why is that? It makes everything so much easier when you're going back and forth on your documents. Okay. So with your date prepared, if it's a different date than when they actually signed, when someone's going to counter or you go to add an addendum to anything, it's going to get confusing about, wait, which date do we actually have an executed RPA? Which date do we actually submit it? Right. As you can see here, because I filled out the cover sheet, look at all the information it's already filled in here for us. So simple. So very simple. So we have an offer from Stephanie because she's buying this house in Long Beach, right? We have the address here. We've got the parcel number already done. We have her offer number, okay? We called Stephanie's lender and Stephanie's lender says, hey, guess what? We can do this loan in 30 days, okay? You can, you do have two options. You can do close of escrow shall occur on a blank date or you can do a certain amount of days. Stephanie, which one is more common? Um, the one you did. Yes. Why is that? Because it's really difficult to close on a specific day, particularly when you have sometimes holdups or you have, um, you know, uh, holidays in there to account for, right? So you're going to have to count for businesses if you put a specific date. It's so much easier to just put days after acceptance. The other reason you want to do that is because if you put a date in there, you don't know how long it could take for you and the other party to go back and forth negotiating this offer until you have actual acceptance, right? You don't know if that could take a day. You don't know if that could take two weeks. So don't lock yourself into putting a specific date. Just put days after acceptance. Okay. So Stephanie, do you want to explain the agency over here and what I would put for this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have to be able to look at the screen. <laughs> so 2A, right, the, the, that box is already checked because you, that is the first document that everyone signed, you know, acknowledging the, the AD, the disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship. Now on 2B, we have to, oops, hold on a sec. Um, I'm gonna let these people in. Okay. All right, so then we have to confirm, right? So make sure that you are putting all the information in on whoever's representing the seller or and whoever's representing the buyer. We have to confirm agency in this. Otherwise, if you do not check the boxes or do not include the license numbers, that will have to be countered back in because it's an integral part of the contract. Um, so therefore, Keller Williams Coastal Property has the listing and Coastal Properties has the buyer, which is me, right? Mm -hmm. So that means we are, that Keller Williams Coastal Properties representing both the buyer and the seller that this is dual agency, even though the agents are different, right? But it's under the broker of Rich Pisani at Coastal Properties. So therefore, Hallie will check the box, both the buyer and seller, and boom, it automatically populates all four boxes. Yeah, it gets confusing. Remember, just like Stephanie said, saying it again, agency is with the broker. It's with the brokerage. Okay. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so now we come to the finance portion. This is the portion that everyone has a difficulty with. Okay. So initial deposit, that earnest money deposit that we were talking about with your buyers, that's right here. Okay. That's this section right here. As you can see, the contract defaults automatically to be a wire transfer. Why? It's easier. It's faster. It's less risky for yourself as an agent and less risky for the escrow department. Okay. So set that expectation with your clients. I'm telling you, do it, set it up front because they're going to have to wire that within three days. Now you can do a cashier's check and you can do a personal check within three business days after acceptance, but I'm telling you, it's much easier and much faster to do the electronic wire. One of the reasons they don't, I discourage you from taking a cashier's check or a personal check, cashier's check, not so much, but personal check is that sometimes it can take days, sometimes a week to actually clear in the escrow account. And in theory, by then 
you're, you're assuming your client's going to have that money in their checking account, right? You're assuming that they're not going to take it out for some other large purchase. And I don't know about you, but we all know what assuming makes of people. I'm not going to say the parable that we all know, but you're assuming that they're going to get that done. So take care of that, right? Make it easy. So the deposit, which again is a portion of the down payment. Stephanie, how much money are you putting down? For the earnest money deposit. No, oh, for, for your, uh, what are you getting? How much are you putting down on your loan? You're going to get a conventional loan, but how much are you putting down? I'm putting 300,000. Actually, no. I'm putting Say a percentage. Say a percentage for me. I'm putting 20%, yeah. Okay, cool. So Stephanie's getting a 20% conventional loan. So we're going to figure out this math a little bit here. Okay. And remember, I encourage you all do not trust the math on the, uh, the automatic math on the, um, on the form, make sure you're double checking it and you can fill it out without the help. So since Stephanie's putting 20% down, I'm just going to write that down. Okay. Normally the EMD is done. So <clears throat> the, the industry standard kind of is 3%. Okay. That's kind of traditional. Anything less than 3% right now is not very competitive. Now, 3% is 3% of the total purchase price. That's not 3% of the down payment. It's not 3% of the actual loan amount. It's 3% of the total purchase price. So since Stephanie's paying 1525000 times 0.3, Oh, not 30.03152512323 times 0.03. Stephanie is going to have an earnest money deposit of $45,750. Okay. $750. Cool. That's 3% of the purchase price. Now remember, this amount is coming from her down payment. Okay. So the next thing that we skip to is down here, we're gonna to go to the loan amount. Now, since Stephanie's getting a conventional loan, the contract defaults to a conventional loan financing. If you have another modes of financing, you can do FHA here, VA, seller financing, which we hardly ever see or other, right? But we're not gonna check any boxes since it's conventional. Now I wanna figure out how much is Stephanie actually getting a loan for? Because if she's putting 20% down, 6% or 3% of that 20 is the EMD, but she's putting down 20%, she's not actually getting a loan for that 20%, right? That doesn't make any sense because she's paying for it in cash, right? So I'm going to do her, I'm going to take the total purchase price, 1525000, and I'm going to times it by 0.2. So Stephanie's putting down $305,000, okay? So I'm going to subtract 1525, subtract 305123, which means Stephanie's getting a loan amount <clears throat> of $1,220,000 dollars. One, two, three. There we go. Okay. So <clears throat> I want to go back, excuse me. <clears throat> I want to go back and I want to check my math. Okay. So since Stephanie's putting down 305,000 and we're going to take, what I'm doing is checking this number right here. Of that 305,000, 45,750 is her earnest money deposit. So the remaining balance of her down payment or purchase price is 259,250. So I just checked my math on that. Do you guys follow me on how we just double check the math and where we came up with those numbers? Does anyone have any questions on that? No. Um, I do have a question. Yeah. Mona yes, has a question. Me. The only one who has questions. That's okay. Um, can you briefly elaborate on 
Can you briefly elaborate on seller financing just so I have an idea what it is? Yeah, so seller financing is when somebody owns the house outright and they're going to basically finance the property for the person to buy it, right? So Mona, if I'm like, <clears throat> okay, I own this house, Mona, and you want to buy this house for me and I'm not going to have you get a loan because we're that close, we're that tight together. You're just going to owe me money. We're going to do our own separate financing right? Like Mona, you're going to pay me, you're going to pay me this amount a month and you're going to give me this amount down. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then if the buyer doesn't pay like one month, they can just take some out. Well, that's a separate issue. That's again, that's a totally separate document. Don't get wrapped up in that Mona because you literally never encounter that <laughs> very, very rarely, very, very rarely. That happens. Huh? No, it, it can. Yeah. Well, we probably hit a market at some point where there's going to be some seller financing. Absolutely. So they're the first, they'll, they'll be the lien holder instead of like Bank of America, it would be Joe Blow, right? Being the lien holder of it. And you guys would have a, an agreement, right? Just like you would with the bank. And then if you default on the loan, then they can go through the, 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 the proceedings to get you out just and like get possession back on absolutely mm -hmm. yeah just so well, i know so someone asked me, like oh, i don't know like you know just wanted to know a little bit yeah no absolutely but again seller financing is exactly what stephanie just said it's when the seller is literally the financier they're literally the lien holder right that's great so no one has any questions on the math part no okay so <laughs> if the seller owns the home hundred percent, like they have no loans against it. Well, yeah, I mean, it just all the, I mean, we're getting into ends. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> the weeds on this. So maybe, you know, there could be, maybe they have a $200,000 loan on it, but they're selling it to you for 1.2. So they'd have that. So, I mean, so then they would be the junior lien hold, you know, so there's a lot of different factors. Yeah. So let's move on. <laughs> yes. Okay. <clears throat> so the other thing that we want to put in here is the thing that we ask the lender, which is how much of, how good of an interest rate they're getting. And we want to make sure that that's protected within the RPI. Okay. So Stephanie, what's your interest rate that you're getting? I'm actually, because this is a jumbo loan. So I'm at, God, I was able to get it for four and a half. Cool. Great. So since Stephanie's loan is for four and a half, I want to make sure that if and when we see some fluctuation, because when Stephanie gets a quote for her percentage and Jojo, her lender that's working with her says, Stephanie, I'm going to give you four and a half. That is the rate of that day or the projected rate that they believe that they can give. Okay. Now the exact rate when they actually lock the loan could be something completely different. So that's why we want to protect Stephanie. If for some reason the market took a dive and the interest rate went up into the fives, we want to make sure that Stephanie has the option to proceed with the home or not to proceed with the home. She has that freedom to get her earnest money deposit back, okay? So in here, in this section right here, this loan shall be a fixed rate not to exceed blank. Most loans right now are fixed rates. Now there are adjustable rate loans, which you see is the second one or commonly known as an arm. Those were more common back in the 2008 times. That's partially what happened with the housing market crash. Okay. Not very common anymore. They're adjustable rate loans. More often than not, it's going to be a fixed rate. So we're going to put in here that again, we're going to account for some fluctuation of the market. Okay, so we're always going to cushion this by a quarter of a point. So 0.25. Got it? So if Stephanie tells me, <coughs> excuse me, Stephanie tells me your interest rate is 4.5, what do I want to write in here? Mona? Um, I'm sorry, I won't call you. Um, so you say the something about not to exceed like 0.2% then the rate, right? So she's, Stephanie's telling me that she 
is getting a 4.5% interest. Oh, then not to exceed 4.75. You just add. I'm so, yes. I'm so silly. Thank you, Yana. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Again, that is to accommodate a fluctuating market. That way it might go up a little bit. So we want to make sure that's protected. Got it? Okay. Does anyone have any questions so far? That would mean, yes, me. I have a question, of course. Um, so that would mean that if the rate at the, at the time that the contract got accepted became 5%, then they, the buyer has the right to like not interest. Them. Exactly. Right. Because remember we talked about fluctuating interest rates and how on the example of a $500,000 loan, a 1% rate increase means a hundred thousand more over the life of the loan that the client's going to be paying. So even a quarter of a point is going to increase their monthly payment and it's going to increase the, the um, overall price that they're paying over the lifetime of the home, whatever their interest rate in terms are, right? So it's important that Stephanie has that option. If she says that her payment needs to be $5,000 a month and that's what 4.5 is, and if it goes to five point and that makes her, that makes her monthly payment five, six, you know, 5,600 a month and she can't afford that. We want her to have the ability to back out of the contract. Right. Got it. Great. Any questions. other questions? Let's try to get through the whole contract today. Yeah, that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we talked about getting, Stephanie, do you want to go over this page? <clears throat> yes, so here we are uh, on page two. So we have the first one, AIDS is verification of down payment and closing costs. This is, okay. um, this is always check that box, please. I'm like really anal about when the box is not check is right, we nuts. So that comes later. Okay. So just check the box and make sure that your proof of funds are there and make sure that they're current and that their names on it. So funny because Renan, uh, one of the Calabasas agents, got an offer. They showed him this amazing proof of funds, no name, no nothing on it, no date. Da, da, da. I'm sure they did this a screenshot from their phone. Um, however, I was just like, hey, can you please resend me the um, proof of funds? Have to have your name on it a little bit. So, um, uh, so make sure the box is checked. The next one is the appraisal contingency and removal. I'm definitely going to keep the appraisal contingency because I want to be able to utilize that as a, um, a tool for myself as to whether I want to pay the difference. But this agreement is or is not right contingent upon a written appraisal and it defaults to 17 days after acceptance. So I want to it to be contingent on the appraisal. <laughs> um, yeah, so then of course, if the appraisal comes in, so I'm offering, what am I offering? 1.5 something? Yeah, 1.525. Okay, so I offered 1.525 uh, list price. And then, um, so let's say for some reason, it came in at 1.5, right? Then there's three different things that can happen. One, I have to make up the difference. Right, I'll have to bring in an extra $25,000 to make up the difference from, from what I can get the loan amount for to what the purchase price is. Or I can say, hey, Mr. Seller, can you, let's do a price reduction to the 1.5. Or I can just get out of the contract, right? We can decide not to move forward with it. Um, so that's regarding the appraisal contingency. Loan terms, uh, right? So we indicated the step on page one but we want to make sure on that we have the letter, check the box, the letter attached, that we have the, you know, the pre-approval letter from the, the um, from the lender on it. And remember guys, uh, we talked about this, I think last Wednesday night, but, um, sorry, I don't know that was, okay. Um, that, we, because sometimes, you know, these buyers are, are it's taking a period of time for them to get into a home, right? And to get their offer accepted, et cetera. So as you are working with your buyers, please have them go through the underwriting process. 
right? So go through the underwriting process. Why do I say that? Because they can get underwritten and get full approval on their loan. So it's almost the same, you know, it's golden. It's almost the same as cash, right? Where an all cash buyer, because, hey, I've already approved. It's only conditional upon the appraisal or only conditional upon, you know, uh, you know, HOA, you know, just different things, right? So make sure that your buyers are continuing to go through the underwriting process so then they have more power as they go, as they move along. Um, loan contingency removal. So, so it defaults for the contingency period to be 21 days for the loan contingency. You can shorten that if you wish. You can shorten the appraisal too if you wish. Everything is negotiable. So that's, um, <coughs> excuse me. So I don't know what you're gonna, did he ask me a question? No, there's some feedback. I don't know who or what, it may be, I don't know what it's coming from, but. Okay, so the, um, so within 21 days, so this is when, you know, when we were talking about when Hallie was mentioning earlier, having the conversation with the lender, hey, you know, how quickly can we get the appraisal back, right? How quickly can we get loan approval? So, cause you always wanna do everything you can to make your offer, especially in this particular market, to make it as attractive as possible. So like I said, that number is always negotiable. Or you can just say no loan contingency on it at all, right? Just saying, hey, you know what? I am solid on this loan. I know there's nothing gonna happen. So let me go ahead and remove all loan contingencies. Or that will be checked, you know, if you, if you marked all cash. Um, remember if you guys do that, we have a separate office addendum that your client needs to sign to understand that they're going against broker advice. Just want to throw that in there. I have a question on section I. Mm -hmm. It looked like you checked the box that would say that it's not contingent on the appraisal. Am I wrong? No, I did. Mm -hmm. Oh, so we're not. Why is that box checked? If we want, we want to have a written appraisal. And we want the offer to be contingent on the appraisal. If we check that box, doesn't it mean that it's not contingent on the, on the That's appraisal? That's correct. That's correct, Yona. Absolutely. I checked that box because Stephanie understands the risk and we talk to the lender and that's what we're doing in this, in this example. So she is removing the appraisal contingency. Yes. Yes. Some of you okay. guys have asked, how do I remove it? And that's how you remove it. That's why I wanted to use that. Oh, okay. Here. I wasn't, I thought no that we're, we're keeping it. Thank you. No problem. Good question. Keep going, Steph. <clears throat> okay. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of inserting your question. No, you're fine. Um, so down here, you guys can see. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so you can see most of these things aren't, aren't really touched. Now, you might add some other addenda and advisories in here that you're going to send. That's per office. So make sure you talk to your coach. Make sure you talk to your team leader, your TC, your broker, whatever it is that you need to add the different advisories when you send the offer over. Those you can check the box, other, and you can put any of that other stuff in there. Okay. Steph, do you want to take up the inspection portion? Okay. Um, yeah. So, so seven is the allocation of costs, right? So basically where we, you know, these are kind of like the standard boilerplate type things. So on uh, 7A1, we always check seller. I mean, anybody can pay for it, but typically the seller pays for the natural hazard disclosure. My NHD is our preferred vendor. And I, I always check environmental. So, and then I, um, leave the other two blank unless there's something you know really super specific that you want to put in there it's not necessary i know a lot of sometimes people put pest inspection but i always tell them to take it out right and just have that part of the inspections that the buyer is doing because if we have the pest inspection in the rpa then then it becomes a part of the agreement and if there's any section one or section two items, or especially section one items in the pest report, then that has to be cleared before you can be a clear to close or you know, get the CD issued and so on and so forth. So uh, I would leave, personally leave out, I know Rich um, advises this as well, to leave out the pest inspection out of the report. And then if necessary, you can always bring it in uh, in your request for repairs. Um, 
And then, yep, we're at the B governmental retrofits, uh, requirements and retrofit. You mark the, the seller on those boxes. Um, and then escrow and title, we get to C, mark both buyer and seller. Each shall pay their own, right? Each shall pay their own. And then escrow shall be seller's choice. And or if you had a conversation with the listing agent and asked them who their uh, who their preference is, then you can put in, you know, whatever it is that they had told you. And then uh, title, seller shall pay for their own title policy. You can put whatever um, uh, title company in there that you want or that they wanted, et cetera. Or we can always pitch our own. We can do escrow holder shall be Pacific Coastline escrow, owner's title policy, clear mark title. That's always okay as well. Um, then we go to other costs. This does not have an HOA, so sh seller shall pay. It county. actually does. Oh, it does? Well, yeah. How much am I paying a month for that? Not very <laughs> much. Okay. <laughs> okay, so then you mark whatever is applicable. So county transfer, city transfer, all the homeowner association stuff. And then uh, seller shall pay for any private transfer fee if applicable. Um. Yep, and then down on home warranty, so seller, you know, it all depends. I mean, I may say, hey, you know what, I'll go ahead and pay for it, right? Because I want to be competitive, so you can put buyer and or seller um, not to exceed. How big is my place? It's pretty big. Okay, so we'll do, do I have a pool? No. <clears throat> Right on the water? It's pretty big. You know, it's important, you guys, people say all the time, what do I write in here? It's important that you know, one, your company that you, that you would like to use. You know, we love Old Republic here in the office, but also understand the plan differences, right? Get the specific dollar amounts because if the plan, <clears throat> excuse me, so if the plan for the home costs $825, they don't actually have to buy that plan, right? Because right here in the RPA, we wrote, seller to pay to pay for the cost not to exceed eight hundred dollars so um, if the upgraded plan is 825 they don't got to buy it does that make sense i'm sorry what you always want to uh, confer with the representative like if you're calling jessica you would call and give her information and get the number from her yeah, you can, but most of them have pricing sheets, Mona. So it'll say like a, a, a house with this much square footage with a pool, with an air conditioner, with this, and it'll give you all the different options. So yes, you can call and confirm before you write the offer, but I know sometimes we don't always have that forethought, right? Because it's maybe the middle of the night, you know, getting ready to write an offer because that's when you have time to do it. You can't call Jessica at 10 right? Well, you might try and I don't know if she's going to answer, but <laughs> you know what I mean? So just get a pricing sheet, know the pricing for the, um, home warranties if you're paying for it. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. So then we're down to items included and excluded from sale, you know, all stoves, refrigerators, washer and dryers. And remember, Keep in mind that refrigerators and stoves, wash and dry is all inclusive. Okay. So sometimes I know I've had some, you know, wrote all refrigerators and but the seller, they accepted the offer, but the seller wanted to keep the refrigerator, let's say in the, in the garage. It's included. The wine refrigerators, the refri no matter where the refrigerator is on the property, it's included, right? If they check that or they happen to mention that it's excluded. Right, so you can have it, you know, these are included except for blah, blah, blah. And then items excluded from the sale, right? the go-to example is of the, you know, the chandelier in the, in the entryway, right? So if we, if, the, if it's, cause there's sometimes there's attached items that are sentimental, right? To certain, you know, to the seller and they may exclude that. So that's where you would include that. And then I just want to make, uh, where it says brackets attached to walls, floors, or ceilings for any such component furniture or items shall remain with the property or will be removed. So you want to have this conversation if there's happens to be brackets attached, because I always tell this example with uh, Eileen, the sellers took all the brackets, 
right? But it wasn't checked that it would that they were to remove it. It was stated that it would stay. You know, for TVs, like you know, holding the TVs up on the wall. Oh, the TV holder. Yep. So Eileen had to go buy brackets for their TVs and get it reinstalled. So I know it probably sounds like like a you know a silly little thing, but it is something. Yeah, always right. remember back to when we went to take the real estate exam about what's a fixture and what's a what's not a fixture and apply that same concept. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Hallie. And then uh, closing in possession, um, buyer uh, intends or does not intend to occupy the property as a buyer's primary residence. So all cash, not a big deal, but if it's a loan, it, it, if it's a loan and they are not intending to uh, purchase it as their primary residence, you have to check that box. Otherwise, it's the lender's fraud. It's fraud. Which box is that? Buyer intends or 9A. Oh, okay. Yeah. So most of, the, most of the time, you know, the buyer, if they're getting a loan, they're buying the property, whatever. But actually, I have, an, uh, I have a escrow right now where the buyer is purchasing it for the mother-in-law, right? So it's not going to be his primary residence. So he has to buy it as an investment property. So we had to make sure that box was checked that he does not intend. Right. Okay. So let's go through to the last really applicable thing. Right, because what are our contingencies? I, J, 14B, right? 14B is the last one. 14B states, 14B1 states that um, it is your inspection contingency, okay? So to be competitive, Stephanie and I want to write a 10 day inspection contingency. That's competitive, right? 10 days or less. Remember, <clears throat> some people say, oh, five days. Here's the thing, it's not just about you doing the inspection. What has to happen during that time as well, Stephanie? That say again? Yeah, what has to happen that same time through all that inspection contingency? What also has to happen besides just getting an inspection? Well, we have to get all our disclosures. Yeah. Right, so I have to be able to, I have to have all the information possible to be able to approve or disapprove the home. Yep. So seller has seven days to get all the, their disclosures to me. So actually I would like to have a seller have five days after acceptance to deliver me all the reports, disclosures and information. So then I can make my decision, right? Uh, you know, it gives me an extra five days to be able to review all the disclosures, et cetera. And then also hopefully they've already ordered their HOA docs because um, that can typically take a, you know, a period of time to be able to get the HOA docs in. So, um, because let's say if you know, my contingencies were removed, all of a sudden we have new disclosure items on it, then now all of a sudden I have another extra five days to approve and disapprove the home. So if you're representing the seller, you always wanna be like, hey, we gotta get on all this shedizzle now, get the prelim done early, order, go ahead and order the NHD before you're even in escrow, get the uh, HOA docs ordered so that you can give a package. Boom, here you go, right? So it's all good to go and you don't, cause you want to eliminate any possibility for the buyer to be able to get out of escrow because you don't wanna have a new disclosure item. So we put seller has five days after acceptance. And remember guys, keep in mind that, so let's say this, the seller accepts my offer today. Today is, what is today, 17th? Yep, so the 17th. So this, the seller went ahead and accepted my offer as is because we wrote such an amazing offer. Today is day zero, right? Today is day zero. And then tomorrow's day one. So that starts the counting. Right, and then I have three business days to get my uh, initial deposit monies in. So that means what tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So I have it till the end of the day, Friday, to get my uh, deposit monies in. And then I, the guy has till the end of Sunday to get me my disclosures. And then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Then I have till the following Friday to get all my inspections done and to remove my contingencies. For the inspection. Okay. 
that's basically it. We do this every time. That's basically it. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Yona. For the, let's say for the contingency for the uh, inspection. So we said, let's say five days. Does that, again, maybe you answer this. I have, we have five days to send them a, a request for repair. And then that means that we, we are in the time limit or let's say we send it on the fifth day and that's when we're supposed to already remove that contingency. So that means it's too late because they haven't responded or. Yeah. So think about it, Yona. They have to respond. <clears throat> you have to, this line right here, time specified. Buyer may request the seller make repairs or take any other action. Seller has no obligation to agree or to respond to buyer's requests. Okay. So in theory, whatever that time period is, you not only have to do the inspection, you have to review the disclosures and you have to submit any requests for repairs if there are any or credits. And then the seller can respond or not respond. All that has to happen within that time period. So for example, Yona, you get the property inspected, find out there's a plumbing problem and your clients are like, Hey, you know, I want this fixed. I, I want this plumbing problem fixed, or I want you to give me a credit. And the seller goes, mm, we're not going to do that. Don't you think you want your buyers to have the option to be able to back out of the property? Yeah. Right. Right. So that's why all that has to happen within that time period. So don't do yourself a disservice and shorten that too long, you know, shorten that too tight that you can't get all that stuff done back and forth. Cause that's a lot to do in 10 days. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Good question. So because we filled out all the cover sheet, ta -da, this whole part is fixed. It's all done down at the bottom. Really simple. Okay. How many other questions, comments? I think we're good. No? Okay. Okay, right. you guys. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Appreciate your time, Stephanie. Great job. Glad Thank you got you the. Amazing as always. Okay, glad you got the computer stuff fixed. Okay, I'm going to run. Thank you. Reach out to your coaches, reach out to your leadership if you guys have more questions.